great to see a, uh, a packed house here today. What should I do? Welcome well, to the first of the Monday lecture series at CAP. I'm Dave Ferguson of the Department of Landscape Architecture. I'll be introducing our speaker. It's a timely topic that John Lyle brings to us today. If you pay attention to any of the reports that we've seen over uh, at least the last couple of years, you become aware that people are saying we're using up our food surpluses, we're using up our water, we're using up our fuel, we're using up our land. And when you step back and look at some of that, you can come, I think, generally to one of two conclusions or stances. And one of them, and it's the tempting one to take, is to simply give up and say, I don't want to hear that anymore and leave me alone and let me do what I've been doing. And I think that's the easy way, but there's another way, and that's to recognize it as a unique opportunity in history to fundamentally change the way people live and the way they see life. And that whole approach or attitude, I think, to some extent, gets summed up in the word sustainability. And sustainability is a word that's being used and, and coined a lot these days. It's, it's entered into the design professions. And uh, to give a brief definition of how it's being used, I think, it, it's simply a way of, or an attitude that allows you or, or coerces you to enhance or at least sustain the vital resources uh, and vital systems that are around us, that we are placed within and that we must live with. John Lyle had spent more than 20 years, he was ahead of his time, he spent more than 20 years looking at the whole idea of sustainability, and sustainability in particular in design, environmental design. He has a background in both architecture and landscape architecture, and he has looked at it from a variety of perspectives and continues to pioneer in the field. He's the author of Design for Human Ecosystems, which uh, is a fundamental text, I believe, for understanding how to work with ecological systems in design. He's the chairman currently of the Department of Landscape Architecture at uh, Cal State at Pomona. He's also most recently the director of the Institute for Regenerative Studies at Pomona, which is an idea and a, an environment that he helped conceive, and uh, he is now in the process of developing and expects to have it fully operational within three years. He's been a Fulbright visiting professor to Yugoslavia. He's been a visiting professor to many countries and schools uh, around uh, uh, the design professions, and he has also worked uh, particularly focusing his ecosystem design approach and sustainability in uh, Italy, Denmark, Costa Rica, and various other countries, and, and at the present time is looking at an invitation to come to Brazil and begin working with the rainforest situation there. We're fortunate and delighted to have him as our guest lecturer today. I'll give you John Lyle. Thank you, David. What I want to talk about today is uh, change. Sometimes I say revolution because that's really what it is, but I've discovered you have to use the word revolution very carefully in the academic environment. So let's just say change. Um, in meeting with a number of the landscape architecture students earlier today, I've discovered that uh, the fact that we live in a time of change is, is no news. They're very much aware of that. 
I think that uh, distinguishes them from most of our culture, which I think uh, tends to uh, hang on to the past and to cling to the notion that uh, uh, we have a stable world. We don't really have a stable world. We have a, a world that's really threatened from many directions uh, with devastation. I think it's a world that is beset by dislocations, contradictions, contrasts, conflicts, many of which arise from the fact that an old era is ending and a new era is beginning and we don't really know yet what that new era looks like. The industrial period has ended and uh, with it have ended life support systems that were essentially destructive to nature. I think that uh, we're faced with the challenge of creating a whole new world, whole new life support systems, a whole new physical environment over the next few decades. I think it's a challenge that uh, you people who are in design school right now will be dealing with through your whole professional lives. And I think uh, you're an important generation in the history of the world because I think you're the generation that will decide whether the human species thrives or goes under. A lot of responsibilities on your shoulders. If you look around, the world still looks pretty stable. We're still riding on the residue of uh, the industrial era. Looking around Muncie today, it's a, it's a pleasant city. And uh, it has a, a feeling of solidity. It has a feeling of an environment that's going to be here for a while. The environment where I come from doesn't really have that anymore. Change is in the air in the Southern California area. Uh, and I think that's partly because the Southern California area is one of the most threatened in the world. It's one of the most environmentally unstable areas uh, in the world today. For example, when you turn on the tap, water comes out. And everybody assumes that water will always come out of the tap. But when you think about where the water comes from in Southern California, it comes from three sources. One is about 230 miles away, and a second is about 340 miles away, and a fourth is over 500 miles away. That water travels all that way to get into your tap. And it drains off of an area that covers about one twelfth of the continental United States. So the watershed of Los Angeles is really about one twelfth of the continental United States. What that means is, in order to support that population in Southern California, we're literally stealing resources from the ecosystems of one twelfth of the continent. We're disrupting wildlife in areas hundreds of miles from the city. We're disrupting whole systems. We're destroying uh, vast areas of landscape in order to allow us to turn on that tap and have the water come out. How long can we sustain that? We drive our cars almost all the time in Southern California. We practically live in our cars. The, the landscape is mostly covered with freeways and parking lots. In order to keep those cars moving, we import oil mostly from Alaska. I think in this particular time, I don't need to remind anybody of the disasters that await in hauling oil by tanker from Alaska to Los Angeles. But we're dependent on it. We can only keep that city going by hauling oil by tanker from Alaska to Los Angeles. How long can we sustain that? The oil runs out in a 
few decades, what happens to Los Angeles then? We eat food that's imported from all over the world. Uh, most of our fresh fruits and vegetables come from the San Joaquin Valley, the Central Valley of California, uh, which has been overproducing for a long time. Uh, thousands of acres are taken out of production in the Central Valley every year because of salinization of soils that simply cannot produce food any longer. So if you drive through the San Joaquin Valley, you see vast landscapes uh, that are barren and covered with a kind of white flaky substance that's salt that collected there because of irrigation practices over a long time. If we keep doing it, the whole thing will be a white flaky landscape in a few decades and there will be no fruits and vegetables for Los Angeles. How long can we sustain that? So as David said, we live in an unsustainable world. And most Americans, most people in the world, haven't really come to terms with that yet. As designers, we have to come to terms with it because it's our responsibility to design the future. And it goes beyond sustainability. It's not just a matter of being unsustainable. This kind of a world is not socially acceptable uh, because it it destroys vast numbers of our population in one way or another, it destroys whole ecosystems. It's not morally acceptable. It's not aesthetically acceptable. Uh, it's got to change, and it will change. The question is, how will it change? Can we guide the change? Our history in dealing with environmental issues is not very encouraging. We tend to ignore impending disaster until it's too late, or almost too late. Uh, we ignored the fact that petroleum supplies must run short sometime until there were long gas lines at the pumps, but then we managed to get together some temporary solutions that postponed the problem for a while. In California, we have periodic droughts, but we never think about drought uh, until the reservoirs are almost dry. If we can overcome that tendency to postpone thinking about possible futures until it's too late, I think there are tremendous opportunities in designing a sustainable world. It's an exciting challenge. And I think that it's an exciting challenge not only because, not only for practical reasons, not only because we want to keep the human race going, but because it's, it's the most intriguing, the most exciting, the most uh, uh, challenging problem uh, that exists, I think, in the world today. It's a difficult problem, but it's one that I think we can deal with, as I'll try to explain now. The environment of the industrial era happened by accident. Despite a lot of planning theory, almost no real planning was carried out and implemented over the last hundred years or so. There are isolated examples, but by and large, our cities and our landscapes grew up by accident. Uh, they just happened. And there's, uh, there are powerful forces in our society that thinks, think that's the way the environment should take form. It doesn't work, it won't work, and if we keep trying to let our environment design itself, we're really looking at disaster. So the question is, can we take control? Uh, can we shape a sustainable future? Uh, I think it's possible, and that's really uh, what I want to illustrate for you uh, today. I'd like to begin by giving you a few basic principles, four, that I think are important. Uh, 
there are probably a lot more. I'm not saying these are the four principles of designing a sustainable future, but I think these four uh, are important. And my years of work in the field has convinced me that these are ways of thinking that we'll have to adopt as we, as our design methods evolve and as we shape our thinking uh, to deal with the future. First, I think we have to continuously remind ourselves that it's impossible to solve one environmental problem. Every time you isolate one environmental problem and solve it, you create a dozen others. We have to solve the whole spectrum of environmental issues in an integrated, simultaneous way. We can't solve water issues without solving energy issues. We can't solve food problems without dealing with energy. We can't we can't preserve our wildlife species unless we also deal with water, energy, and food. So they all go together, and we need to work with them uh, as an integrated whole. Second, I think it's important to remember that we can't separate people from environment or technology. I think one of the great mistakes of the industrial era was the mistake of thinking we can deal with technology apart from people. Uh, we can invent a technology and we can implement it and worry later about how people deal with it. That doesn't work. People have to be an integral part of a whole system that includes technology and humanity and the natural environment. When we deal with new ways of doing things, we have to think about how people will relate to these, how they will affect people's lives, how people can live with them, what the social effects are, uh, what the moral effects are, how they will change the way we live. Third principle, the only model for sustainability that we have is the natural ecosystem. The natural ecosystem is the only environmental support system that's ever existed that is indefinitely sustainable. And uh, it's, it's a model for our thinking, the only viable model we have. In order to design a sustainable future, we must understand how natural systems work and we must work with those principles. We must apply them in practice. And finally, the way we deal with design has to expand to incorporate invisible processes. Design has traditionally dealt with the visible. Uh, we shape forms, we shape the things we see, and we think we're designing an environment. In fact, Every time we make a change in the things we do see, we make thousands of changes that we don't see. And until we really understand the invisible processes that underlie the visible world and learn to incorporate an understanding of those processes into our design, we won't be able to design a viable physical environment. What I want to show you today is really an application of those four basic ideas and a lot of others uh, that I've been working on over a long time. Uh, exactly how long I've been working on it depends on uh, where you put the beginning. And uh, I'll talk about that as we go along. Uh, but in the process of doing that, I've learned a few things that might be useful to other people. I don't have all the answers. Uh, it's really just a beginning. What I'm talking about is no more than a beginning. All of these ideas, I think, will be will developed and evolved and sophisticated and uh, expanded uh, over the next few years and few decades. I think we'll find that uh, 
the whole concept of designing human ecosystems will uh, expand to the point where it's a, uh, a far more exact and far more complex and sophisticated process than we can even envision today. It'll have to be if we're really going to design a sustainable world. But what I'm going to present to you is at least a beginning in the applications of these ideas. Uh, I guess the best way to approach the projects that I want to talk about is to tell it as a story. Adjacent to the university where I teach in Southern California, there's a landfill. A landfill where the solid waste from uh, an area about uh, eight or ten miles in radius uh, is dumped. That landfill's been operating since 1956. And five years ago, it was almost filled, almost completed. They'd almost run out of room. It's operated by the County Sanitation District, which is a public agency that uh, deals with solid waste in Los Angeles County. And officials of the sanitation district came to the president of the university and asked him if there's any possibility that the university would give its approval to an expansion of the landfill. Well, we all know the problems associated with landfills, and that was an era when uh, uh, almost everybody was fighting against having a landfill uh, in their backyard or next door or even two or three miles away. And uh, nobody seriously believed that Cal Poly would, would uh, approve this exp landfill expansion, but uh, the president said that he'd be willing to think about it because he had a sense that there might be some important possibilities here. He uh, had some discussion with the sanitation district and ended up appointing a faculty committee. That's what you do in the university environment when you don't know what to do, you appoint a faculty committee. And uh, so that's what he did. And he chose a faculty member from each of the six colleges in the university. And uh, he chose, in my opinion, very wisely because he chose people uh, who had uh, who had a professional interest in the whole in, in environmental issues. Uh, from the College of Science, he chose an ecologist. From the College of Engineering, he chose a civil engineer. Uh, there was an anthropologist from the College of Arts and uh, an agronomist from the College of Agriculture. And, uh, and myself from the College of Environmental Design. Uh, that group deliberated for a long time, had a lot of discussions with the sanitation district engineers, and we began to see possibilities in this too. I think, first of all, uh, we had a notion that the, it's time for the university to begin to come to grips with some of the difficult, really challenging environmental problems of the society. Uh, universities haven't done that by and large. They haven't contributed much really to uh, the solution of environmental problems. We also felt that everybody else was saying, no landfill in my backyard, put it in somebody else's backyard. Uh, we felt that Maybe it was our responsibility uh, to accept it in our backyard and see what we could do with it. So, that, so we eventually worked out uh, an agreement with the sanitation district that we would accept the landfill in our backyard, but the price would be high. Uh, the price was that first they would contribute all the land 
that the landfill was on, plus some other county land to the university, and that they would provide funding for ongoing research in uh, waste management, but also in the whole realm of land use and land management in relation uh, to waste issues. So we ended up establishing uh, that whole area, along with some other university lands nearby, a total of 344 acres, as uh, an institution that we call Land Lab, uh, which is a, an area for research and demonstration in the sustainable use of land resources. Land Lab now belongs to the university, is operated by the university, uh, the landfill goes on. There's a lot of research going on in relation to the landfill, which carries out, is carried out by the university. And the whole thing is funded by the county sanitation district. Uh, a very odd kind of juxtaposition of things, but one that's working very well, I think. Okay, let's take a look at Land Lab. There are some, uh, I have a few slides just to give you a notion of uh, what it's all about. Not getting up. I'm pushing the button and nothing's happening. Yeah. This one. Okay. Well, you all know the title now. Uh, this is the land that uh, Land Lab is on in the, in the background there. And here's a, another view. That's the landfill as it was about uh, two years ago. Uh, it's, that's about half its height. It'll eventually grow a lot taller. And uh, this is the plan, the master plan. The, the university committee put together this, this master plan for uh, the uses of the uh, landfill and the surrounding areas. About half of that, uh, of the area you see there is landfill, the rest is undisturbed uh, landscape. The, uh, on the landfill itself, we'll do a whole range of uh, experiments related to the uh, use of composted waste materials, in, uh, for soil regeneration, for growing crops, for growing trees, uh, for developing, for land regeneration, for uh, recreational use, and so on. Uh, there's a range of other uses involving a, uh, an area where we uh, are doing some research on uh, uh, creating wildlife habitat. Uh, there's an area for botanical research and demonstration uh, there's a, uh, an area for uh, uh, experimentation in uh, energy resource recovery systems, uh, areas for experimental agriculture, and uh, a whole range of things. Uh, this operation is in place now and working, and there's about uh, 15 research projects going on uh, on the site. Uh, right now. Now, another part of our agreement with the county sanitation district was that uh, they allow us to design the form of the finished landfill. And so we spent quite a lot of time studying the topography of the surrounding hills and developing a, a form that would fit into the that would reflect the natural forms of the hills around. And uh, the profiles on the bottom show uh, how that works and give you some idea of a landform, which, is, uh, which was a major departure uh, for the sanitation district, which uh, had always done its landfills just as big mesas with steep slopes on the sides, which stick out like sore thumbs. Uh, so far, this is 
uh, worked out pretty well, but we won't really know how that farm works uh, for another 20 years until the uh, landfill is finished. A few sketches showing uh, what the finished landfill will uh, look like uh, from uh, various points around. I don't want to dwell any more on the whole of Land Lab because I'm really just talking about it here as a context uh, for a smaller but more ambitious project that's uh, the major component of Land Lab. And that's the institute that we call the Institute for Regenerative Studies. The, uh, what we're really concerned about at Land Lab is what we really want to point our research and our educational projects at is making landfills unnecessary. We're looking to a future that can operate without such a clumsy way of dealing with its waste. A future where we're able to uh, recycle all our waste, reuse all the materials that are now uh, going into landfills and do this indefinitely. And we want to uh, apply the same principle uh, to everything else in our life support systems. The Institute for Regenerative Studies is uh, an environment where we can look at that, the whole range of life support systems and look to a future where landfills and similar kinds of devices won't be necessary. It's a 16-acre site, and it's in green there to show you the location in relation to uh, Land Lab at the top of the slide. Uh, and to just, just to give you a little more orientation, there's a, a major street uh, that's at the very top of the plan. Uh, that street's called Temple Avenue, and on the other side of that street is the main Cal Poly campus. So this is really a total 344-acre addition to the campus, and uh, the Institute is a 16-acre expansion of the campus that will be a community of 90 people. About uh, 80 of those will be students, about 10 will be faculty members and visiting scholars, and they will live there, form a community, and uh, operate their own life support systems. That is, they will uh, generate their own energy, uh, deal with their own waste, manage their own water, grow their own food, provide their own shelter, and essentially become a uh, self-operating, uh, ecologically-based uh, community. It will be an integral part of the university. The students will be regular university students, and the faculty will be regular university faculty, except for the visitors who are there for a fairly short time. I'll sh these slides show the site. Uh, again, land, the institute is not located on fill land. It's very risky to build any kind of structures on, on fill land because of subsidence problems. Uh, this is uh, uh, virgin landscape. has been used for grazing for a long time. And uh, it's uh, rolling topography. Uh, with a deep valley in the center, which you see in the background. Uh, in uh, designing the institute, we uh, once the land lab master plan was completed, we formed a design team uh, to develop the design for the institute. And uh, then uh, received funding uh, from the county sanitation district uh, to work on that design for two years. Uh, the money they provided was part of the research money that they provide for the uh, uh, research related to Land Lab. Now, at that point, the institute was not an entirely new idea. The idea itself of establishing such a community on the campus was about 10 years old by that time. It had first originated in a graduate design studio that I taught uh, at Cal Poly. 
And uh, I had given it a, as a design problem. Uh, the reason I gave it was because it provided a medium uh, for exploring the whole range of ecological issues uh, involved in supporting a human population. A, a range of issues that I think designers need to become a lot more aware of. Uh, water, uh, energy, food, uh, waste, all of those things I think need to be integrally considered uh, as a part of design and not separately considered as engineering problems uh, that simply are inputs into design. So uh, we had started with that design problem 10 years earlier and then uh, we had given that as a design problem for several years and in the process learned an awful lot about how a community of this sort might work. And so there was a big background of information, ideas, concepts, uh, and expertise that existed. And when we, when uh, Land Lab began to take form, that became the context for the Institute for Regenerative Studies. So we, we just planted the idea that had already developed into Land Lab and then let the two influence each other. This is the site. These are two, mem two member, one member of the design team. We, we assembled a desi design team of 10 people uh, representing a whole range of different uh, academic disciplines. Uh, there were two landscape architects. Uh, there were two architects, uh, one of whom is a specialist in, uh, 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 in renewable energy systems. Uh, there were two agronomists. Uh, there was an aquaculturist, there was a civil engineer who specializes in, in uh, uh, water systems. Uh, there was an anthropologist. And uh, uh, that team worked together uh, over those two years very closely together in shaping the, the design that I'm uh, going to show you now. The man on the left there it was uh, one of our two agronomists. He also uh, happened to have uh, 25 years of experience a, as an ag agricultural uh, missionary in Africa, so he brought a very strong third world perspective. In the process of the design, we also uh, brought in a number of consultants from all over the world, people who had been involved with similar issues, some of whom ran similar in institutes in other places. Uh, on the right, though, there is Toshihiro Takami, who runs the uh, Asian Rural Institute near Tokyo, uh, which is an institute about the same size that trains agricultural leaders for uh, third world countries. Uh, so we had a number of these people who uh, had very strong influence on the uh, design process. And another shot of the landscape of the institute, and uh, in this case on the left there is uh, Another member of the design team in the red shirt, that's Arthur Jokla, who's a geologist and soil scientist. The uh, interdisciplinary aspect is very important because in dealing with the range of subjects that we want to deal with, uh, it's absolutely essential to draw on uh, a variety different disciplines. All of the knowledge necessary doesn't reside in any one place. I think in a situation like this, the designer's role then uh, becomes one of being the, the integrator who puts it all together and gives it form. And uh, in this case, that was essentially uh, my role uh, with the help of uh, uh, the three other designers on the team. There were also uh, two uh, graduate students, one in landscape architecture and one in architecture, uh, who worked with the team and uh, did, <coughs> uh, did uh, uh, quite a lot of the graphic work, as well as having a, a strong input into the uh, design itself. What I want to do now is take you through a part of the design process, because I think that's very important. Uh, one of my major interests over the last 20 years has been 
uh, how do we shape so what do we have here? the design process? How do we reshape the way we think about design to deal with this complex realm of ecological issues? And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think one thing we have to do is to think more in terms of process, less in terms of form. I think as we think through processes, ecological as well as social processes, and as we begin to shape processes, then form tends to grow out of that. So I think we might think in a sense that uh, form doesn't necessarily follow function, but form follows flow. And I'm going to try and illustrate that, what I mean by that, uh, with a series of slides that shows how we shape the system of flow, that is, of material and energy flow through the system, how we, we, we designed that system of flow and then let that evolve into form. What you see on the screen now is a very early sketch uh, that was developed by the design team uh, during its uh, first few weeks of deliberation on the subject. Putting together everything that all of us knew, this is a very crude, sketchy, rough representation uh, showing how the system of flow of energy, water, and nutrients might work. Uh, in, a, in a system like this. If you translate that into ecological terms, we're trying to describe uh, the function of the ecological system. Ecologists like to uh, describe the order of an ecological system in terms of structure and function. Structure being uh, the pattern of material and energy flow. Well, here is the, the flow as it, as it might take shape an early concept, uh, comparable to a very rough sketch in the early stages of a design process. And uh, I'll try to just give you some notion sure, sure, sure. of uh, the basic yeah, ideas at work here. Um, but, uh, you see uh, people here representing the, the human community. And you see over here, uh, you see crop growing areas. And uh, here you see an aquaculture pond uh, here you see three sewage treatment ponds. So we have, uh, from the, the uh, uh, food growing area, we have an arrow uh, feeding uh, nutrients, fruits and vegetables, uh, into the, the human environment over here. And we have other arrows feeding in from, from aquaculture, from the animals, meat and milk, and so on. Uh, if, you, if you look at the humans as uh, organic parts of the system, uh, the nutrients flow through them and then into, uh, uh, into a waste treatment system. And uh, what we want to do is uh, treat those wastes on site and recycle them uh, so that the nutrients are fed back into, recycled back into the into food production. Uh, we can do that through uh, an aquaculture treatment system in which we have a series of ponds uh, in which we grow aquatic plants. Aquatic plants have the property of drawing nutrients out of water very, very rapidly. And uh, uh, we can use water hyacinths, or we can, and which is shown here, or we can use bulrushes, or there are a number of other aquatic plants that uh, can do that. Uh, we put the, uh, first we screen the sewage, primary treatment, and then we put it into a pond with uh, water hyacinths. We leave it there for a couple of days, and then we put it in a second pond, and uh, the first pond should be covered because there are odors involved with it. Uh, but then it goes into the second pond. There, there are no odors. And the water is good enough to grow fish. So we put fish in there. And uh, we leave it in there a couple of days. More of the nutrients are drawn out. Then we put it in a third pond where still more of the nutrients are drawn out. And at this point, after, going, after spending two days in each of these ponds, uh, with nothing more 
than the water hyacinths to treat the water. It's, uh, uh, the water quality is high enough to use for irrigation. So we can draw the water out of the pond, out of the third pond, and, uh, uh, and uh, use it for irrigation water in the cropping area. We can also harvest those water hyacinths, which grow very, very rapidly, and use that material uh, as cattle feed, so it goes up, or animal feed, goes up to the animals. Uh, we can also uh, put it in a uh, digester and make biogas with it, and the biogas feeds back into the human environment to be used for uh, cooking or whatever. Uh, and then the residue uh, that's still there makes a pretty good fertilizer, so that can go into the cropping area uh, also. We also have a, a, a separate aquaculture pond out here where we can put animal waste, which uh, fertilize the pond food chain and uh, make a very, uh, a very rich environment for growing fish. A very highly productive aquaculture system can be based on that. And then that water is, uh, after it's gone through that pond, is also used for crop irrigation. So it goes into the cropping areas also. So that's the basic idea. Everything, uh, uh, water and nutrients recycle uh, internally. And that's the concept that we, uh, we applied in uh, the design of the system. It got a lot more refined than that later in a lot more detail, but that remained the kind of basic idea. Now this slide shows uh, some refinement of that system, still basically the same system, but uh, it's really the next stage in the ecosystem design process, in the process of designing the flows. And in this case, uh, the red arrows represent energy, the blue arrows represent water, the brown arrows represent nutrients. So you can see, uh, if you follow this through, and uh, we won't really take the time to follow it all the way through, but if you follow it through, you can see how energy, water, and nutrients flow through uh, this, uh, this system. So we're beginning to design a human ecosystem. Now we start to apply that to the site, and uh, this show this is a plan in the lighter tones in the background. You can see the plan of the site, and here we have the water flow system as it works on the site, which is uh, translating that the flow diagrams that I showed you uh, into real forms on the real uh, site. And uh, here is the deep valley that I mentioned. Uh, earlier that runs through the center of the site right there and that becomes a kind of uh, architectural or man-made river uh, a series of aquaculture ponds that's the real that's the spine of the uh, uh, of the development and uh, aquaculture it turns out is uh, extremely important it plays a critical pivotal role uh, in uh, in a human uh, uh, agricultural ecosystem because uh, A, it provides the best medium for recycling water and nutrients. The best medium for, uh, uh, for taking waste and converting them into something useful. It also is an extremely productive process and therefore an extremely economically viable process. This has been known and applied in China for 3,000 years. Uh, we're only beginning to understand this in the United States. It's only in the last uh, three or four years that aquaculture has been regarded as an important activity, as a real industry in the United States. But it is and it will be, and I think you'll see it increase enormously in importance because of its ecological efficiency in, uh, in the future. But it turned out to be at the very core of this uh, system. Uh, from the ponds, uh, we take water up to the hilltops, and you see the lines leading from the ponds up to the, uh, the hilltops. This is an overflow pond at the end, by the way. Uh, these ponds are designed, they're 
rectilinear and, and uh, very orderly because uh, you need consistent forms and simple forms for aquaculture research so that you can do replicable uh, experiments. Uh, the overflow all goes into uh, this larger reservoir at the end. Uh, this is the input pipe. That is the output pipe. So this is the uh, uh, pipe that flows into the uh, reservoir. On top of each hilltop, though, is a, a storage tank. We use wind pumps to get water from the ponds up there, and store the water, and then distribute that water uh, onto the, uh, into the hillside uh, agricultural areas for agricultural irrigation. An important part of the Institute is working with more efficient and uh, more sustainable irrigation techniques. I mentioned that a lot of land in California has gone out of production because of salinization problems. That's a problem that has uh, beset every irrigation-based civilization that's ever existed. Uh, every irrigation-based civilization in history has eventually uh, died because of soil salinization. And uh, there are ways of preventing it that relate to drainage, that relate to uh, uh, applying exactly the right amount of water exactly where it's needed, uh, and that relate to very careful management of the whole irrigation system. So we can avoid salinization problems, but we need uh, better techniques, we need better monitoring techniques, we need better uh, irrigation technology in order to do that. That's an important part of the uh, Institute's research. We also have some areas that are not irrigated at all, but in the Southern California area, your food growing possibilities are very, very limited, and limited to really only two or three months of the year uh, if you don't irrigate. Uh, the uh, water that's actually consumed by humans uh, uh, for the time being will come out of the uh, uh, domestic water supply which is out here and you can see it flowing into the, the village or the living areas are there. It flows in, it's used and then goes to the sewage treatment ponds that are there and then that is also uh, used for uh, irrigation purposes. So the point I want to make is that uh, we start with this concept of a flow system, which is analogous to a design concept, a form concept in design. We go from there to a refinement of that flow concept, and we go from there to uh, putting that on the land in terms of form. Uh, now I want to show you another concept related to uh, uh, how we deal with the ecological system. This is a very rough uh, conceptual sketch uh, cross-section of the Institute landscape. And uh, uh, you can see that it's basically composed of a rolling hill, a rolling hill on each side, and uh, the uh, uh, architectural river flowing uh, through the center at the lowest uh, point. And uh, the, the point here is that uh, there's a, a range of topography here. Uh, there's, uh, there are slopes that range from almost flat uh, to about 50%. Each of those can be used in some way but uh, the way that we use them has to be carefully adapted to the form of the landscape. Uh, some cropping systems are suitable to slopes of less than 10%. Some are suitable to uh, steeply sloping land of as much as 50%. But uh, it has to be very carefully distributed over the landscape. So this was an early study of how we might distribute cropping systems and human habitation in relation to land. Uh, the water-related kinds of uh, agricultural activities uh, in the valley at the bottom, uh, and then on the uh, more sloping sites, 
Uh, you see some uh, sloping between about 10 and 30 percent. You see some terracing like that. Uh, as we get to the higher on the hills, there are areas that slope uh, between about 7 and 12 percent, which are suitable for uh, uh, contour plowing and intercropping uh, up, up there and over there and there. Uh, slopes steeper than that are really uh, suitable for agroforestry, that is, planting systems that keep the roots of the plants in place. If you try to plant on slopes steeper than that, uh, I'm sure most of you are aware, uh, if you try to plant crops that, that have to be dug up every year, then you get severe erosion problems. So agroforestry on the steeper slopes. Uh, there's more to it than that, but that was the initial uh, concept. And then that translates into this plan based on topography, which uh, shows the different cropping systems that we use. Uh, the uh, uh, upland grain contour plowed areas near the tops of the hills, there are four hills, and you see the, uh, their crowns are contour plowed. Uh, the bottom lands, uh, the architectural river and water related plantings flowing through the valley, through the center. Uh, terraced areas here, uh, more terraced areas over here and here, and then the uh, agroforestry on the steep slopes there, and uh, then uh, and over here, and then here we have the village site. The village site uh, was selected for uh, on on the basis of two criteria. One, uh, it's on slopes that uh, are between 10 and 30 percent, uh, which is, uh, that is land that's not ideal or easy for agriculture. The question always arises, why don't you build on the easiest to build on land, which is the flat land uh, in the valley bottom? Well, the reason is it's too valuable for agriculture. Uh, so you don't build on it, you use it to grow things. Uh, the, the land that's best for building is really the hillsides and uh, that hillside, the village hillside, is south facing, which is the uh, orientation that allows the, the best control of incoming solar energy. And then around the village, uh, we have uh, intensive vegetable and fruit growing systems that are uh, useful in urban situations. So the, uh, all of the planting in and around the village uh, it consists of useful uh, plants that produce either food or fiber. And uh, so we have here what we might call a kind of uh, uh, agricultural uh, or urban agricultural uh, ecosystem. So that's the, the basic uh, distribution of, uh, uh, of agricultural systems over the, uh, the variations in landscape. And we have rep represented here at least in general form, most of the kinds of landscapes that we find in most parts of the world, that is most of the degrees of slope, most of the aspects that we find in most parts of the world. Uh, so it becomes uh, a kind of agricultural uh, microcosm where we can experiment with a, a, a full range of uh, techniques. Uh, and then this early sketch, this is the third of the early sketches that were done to kind of uh, begin thinking about concept, uh, represents uh, agricultural systems that are polycultures, not monocultures. If we'd done a similar sketch of a monocultural uh, agricultural landscape, uh, of course, we'd have the same plant all the way across, just a repetition, just rows of the same thing. What we're saying here is that we want to work with uh, complex combinations of plants that complement each other, that complement each other either by providing uh, environment for each other, by pro providing climate control for each other, uh, by uh, providing protection from pests or other things. They also serve humans by providing uh, a, a more diverse diet. Uh, with this kind of a system, we can plant a full diet for a human being. We can, we can have the, the full range of, 
uh, dietary needs, which we can't do with a monoculture. So structurally, an ecologist would call this the, the structure or the combination of species uh, that we're dealing with here. What we want is a structure composed of, of an interactive combination, an inter integrated interactive range of species rather than uh, a single species. And this is uh, a representation of the plan of the whole institute, which uh, shows all of the concepts that I've just been talking about in place and what the whole thing uh, looks like. And uh, you can read this plan uh, by a vocabulary of agricultural systems. And one thing that we want to do, we're very interested in the idea of making the ecology of the place visible. I talked about working with invisible processes, which is essential to ecological design. But then I think the next step is to find ways of making those invisible processes visible and expressing them in, the way, in a way that we can read in the landscape so that the landscape becomes understandable uh, to everybody. And we be begin to communicate uh, these kinds of ideas, uh, the concept of the landscape as, as human ecosystem uh, to uh, the whole population. And what I mean by that, uh, you can see in this sketch, uh, which shows uh, four of the forms in the vocabulary. Uh, on the uh, extreme left there, you see the, uh, the contour plowed area, which is, uh, takes uh, the form of those uh, uh, gentle curves that kind of wind around the hilltops. Uh, in the uh, upper left, you see agroforestry with the uh, trees. Uh, upper right, you see the terraced areas. Uh, lower right, uh, you see the uh, intensive vegetable production beds, uh, which uh, uh, take a kind of urban form because they're very highly ordered in an architectural way uh, for uh, maximum uh, uh, productivity in a small space, and also for maximum interaction with the people who work with them. Uh, uh, long pathways for people who work with them and long planting beds for the uh, plants. So uh, four very different forms, each expressing uh, a different kind of agricultural system. If we follow this through consistently, uh, what we hope is eventually they'll read with equal clarity in the landscape itself. And another uh, a shot of the, the plan of the Institute as, as a whole. And, and if you remember that vocabulary, you can very easily read this plan now and, uh, and see what kind of cropping system fits into the overall pattern where. Now this is a five acre area within that larger plan and we might go back. Uh, what we're gonna be talking about is this area right here. And uh, this uh, 